We are live. Yay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to Ghost Education 101. As you can see, we've had a little change in schedule tonight. Um, there was a, a last minute scheduling conflict with Kenneth Holden. So Heather's getting that um, rearranged on the schedule. So he will be back sometime. So if you were um, hoping for an evening of mediumship discussion, we've got something even more fun for you. <laughs> we have our own educator, uh, Lisa Schnur with us tonight. She is the haunted librarian. She has the best blog ever. If you haven't <laughs> gone to see it, I suggest that you do. It's an award-winning blog. And she is going to talk about haunted Halloween traditions, superstitions, and true crime. This is going to be really good. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> so, no pressure at all there. So if any of you have questions, I'm going to try to be watching. Sorry, this isn't on StreamYard, but I do not have StreamYard that um, I can't do two things at once. So I use Zoom because I'm old. So don't. I don't want to hear anything about it. So <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to Lisa and I'm going to turn my camera off and you just have a great time. And I'll, I'll watch for questions in the chat. Okay. Thank you, Philip. And it's been like forever since I've talked to you too. Um, even though I've been lurking on the, um, on the different shows that Ghost Education 101 has been having, I haven't been, I haven't presented in a few months. Um, yeah. I know. And so when Heather contacted me, I was like, oh, Halloween. Got my yes. charms. I'm jingling. It okay. starts Halloween season right after Christmas. So we're getting. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's not Boxing Day in America. It's Halloween. Exactly. <laughs> December 26th. So, yeah. So um, I'm going to um, plug the latest that I'm reading Florida, um, Haunted Florida Love Stories by my friend Chris Balzano and then um we went to you just moved to Florida in case anyone has missed that you've just moved to Florida from Georgia from Georgia we moved back we moved back to Florida after 21 years <laughs> wow after a few years in Georgia um yeah. we are in Gainesville and when we went down to St. Pete for a little bit for a weekend like little fast trip uh-huh. I was gifted with my lovely Salvador oh. Dali. Oh my gosh. That is gorgeous. It's still in the wrapper because yeah. I can't bring myself to open it yet. No, those are collectible right there. Well, I had ordered one on Etsy from England and I think she, and I mean, admittedly I underpaid for the value of it. And I think yeah. she figured it out. And so <laughs> it got lost in the mail. Oh, geez. That's yeah. Horrible. No, but you know, it's okay. It's okay. It wasn't meant to be. And yeah. so, um, so yes. And then I've got my Halloween decorations and, um, I, and so when Heather contacted me, I was like, oh yes, we can talk about Halloween because we have a slight little chill in the air here. Um, almost ready for my, my winter wear, my Florida winter wear. Already. It's, it was hot here in Atlanta today. It's still hot and humid. Yeah, it was hot today. It was 91. And then it, because last week it was like in the mid 80s and it was nice. And I was so excited. I'm going to take my bracelet off because it's jingling and I talk with my hands. Um, so I was like, A any reason to talk about Halloween? I'm game. I'm Absolutely. Game. So, one more thing if everyone could please share this stream with all your friends and groups and everything and help us keep promoting ghost education. We really appreciate it because all of our people work really hard to put these fabulous presentations together for you all for free. So yes, because we, we work yeah. hard for you, but we enjoy it and we do it because we love it. So we do, okay. we do. Um, and so that's why it's like, yes. And, and any time for me to talk because I'll be back in December for um, haunted Christmas stories. Stories, yes. Because um, kind of as a segue into the show tonight, ghost storytelling was actually a Christmas tradition. 
Really? It, it was. It started out as a Christmas tradition where you sat, the families came together with the fire and they would tell, they would tell ghost stories. And um, that was part of the inspiration for Charles Dickens with his Christmas tale um, with the ghost is because that's what they did. And so tonight I'm going to talk about how Halloween has become the second most popular um, popular and financially successful, I guess, holiday, and how um, we've kind of adapted it into the ghost telling holiday. So let me see if I can. Well, I'll tell you my, my Halloween story. Last year on Halloween, I was in St. Augustine and I did a live stream. Um, John Daugherty and I did a live stream from St. Augustine. So be sure you can find it on uh, Paranormal United Network, I believe, from last year. Then the year before that, I was home and I had um, bought us a fog machine. I'd made this big laser vortex shooting out of my garage. I had scary music going and not one trick-or-treater. I was so disappointed. I think I scared them all. <laughs> I think they were too too afraid to come up to my house. But anyway, all so right. I'm gonna talk about trick or treating too, and, and the tradition of it, um, because we're in a we're in a new subdivision, and they had yeah. six trick or treaters last year. And wow. so on the neighborhood Facebook page, everybody's like, you know, because we're all psyched and excited to have trick or treaters, but we have a subdivision that's right next to us that is like huge. And I want, it's on Sunday gone. this year, isn't it? I believe yep, it's on Sunday. Sunday. So I wonder, I mean, I haven't heard anything. Are they doing it on Saturday night? Or are they going to keep it on Sunday? I really, I haven't heard. And with the COVID, I know last year was a bus. So hopefully the kids can get out this year. I think so. Um, in Georgia, where we lived, it was always the day of, um, the date that Halloween fell on, no matter what date it yeah. was, school night, no night, whatever. Uh, yeah, well, growing up, it was in the middle of the week on a school night. That's when you went. Yeah, you just were a little bit tired the next day. <laughs> oh, I was always tired. So I hated to get up in the morning. So I still do. All right, I'm going to turn my video off. I will okay. see everybody at the end and you just go for it. Awesome. First question though, is it full screen, Philip? Um, it's not. And I don't know how to. Okay, let me see, because I thought I had, let me. So we're having technical, dis well, I am having technical yeah. difficulties, not the, um, okay, there, we can do that, I think, where I go full screen. Let me go full screen on that and see if that does it. Does, so is it predominantly the, the PowerPoint and then yes, the little box? Yes, full screen. You're good. Oh, perfect. Those are awesome. great photos, by the way. I love the witches on the bottom. Well, let me tell you. Um, so um, I have a note there. They are create. They are from most of the images I use in the PowerPoint tonight are from Gecko Gals, which is a digital format, um, image, digital image business that you can purchase the images on Etsy. And oh. um, I do have a disclosure at the end. I am actually going to be one of their design team members for 2022 because I make junk journals. And um, so most of these images are from them. And so, yes. And they're like, their sheets cost like $2. Oh, wow. Sheets. And there's like eight, like they're full. So at the end, I'll show you some sheets because um, okay. they're beautiful, beautiful. But, I'll turn my mic off now and let you take over. Awesome. So tonight we are talking about haunted Halloween, traditions, superstitions, and true, true crime. So admittedly, Halloween can be a multi-volume book set, right? And as the author of this presentation, I kind of had the leisure and luxury of selecting what I wanted to talk about. Um, so, um, and I am by no means an expert on Halloween. I am just a huge fan, huge fan, probably like most of you. But like I said, I was have, or I'm still having technical difficulty tonight. And so this was the screen capture on my, um, when I was sitting there. So th there I am, not really, cause it's a ghost. It's a ghost, which is kind of fitting for tonight's presentation. So we're gonna start off with the history of Halloween. And like I was just stating a few minutes ago, ghost telling and telling ghost stories was actually done at Christmas time. And um, it really wasn't done at Halloween. And 
um, Halloween is kind of been, it's a kind of like a hijacked holiday and it's a mix that I'll talk about of many cultures and so forth, but it has solid history going back thousands of years, thousands of years. It um, related to the pagan holiday, Samhain, which um, is spelled S-A-M-H-A-I-N, but it's pronounced Samhain. Halloween has had many names. It's been called All Hallows Eve, All Hallows Even, and then it was shortened to Hallow Even or Hallow Ian with the V gone. And that's how we actually get the modern day spelling of Halloween. That's how the name came about. So the Celtics had this rich tradition of celebrating Samhain and they had a huge bonfire. And um, the night before November 1st, October 31st, they celebrated with a huge bonfire because it was the end of um, summer and it was the beginning of um, winter where they were going through autumn into winter. And so November 1st was their new year. That was the start of their year. And so they had a very large celebration in America, in the United States, which is um, predominantly what I'm going to talk about in terms of tradition. Halloween really wasn't a deal here. And it didn't really become a deal until the Irish potato famine in the mid 1800s, um, 1845 to 1852, when 1 1.5 million Irish immigrants came to the United States and they brought this rich tradition with them. And um, really we can attribute the modern day celebration of Halloween in America that has grown out into around the world to this tragic event where the Irish came over. It is the second most popular holiday in the United States. It is a $9 billion industry. And that figure actually is higher when you include other, other industries that I'm going to talk about as well. It's incredibly popular. And so it has with it traditions. And these rich traditions mostly come from Great Britain. So they played games games, right? We, we love games. And so it evolved into these parties where I will talk about also, but there were games that were associated with Halloween based on um, courting rituals like suitors and so forth. And so the first game that I'm going to talk about is snap apple. Snap apple was where they placed an apple at the end of a stick or a string and um, tied the hands of a female and a male who were on each side and the first female and male to bite into the apple that's dangling, right? Um, if you can visualize it, they were going to get married. <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. And then we have bobbing for apples and bobbing for apples actually dates back to 43 AD. And so when the Romans invaded, the Celtic area, Great Britain, they brought with them apple trees. And the apple tree was in honor of the goddess of fertility, Pomona. And so the Romans were trying to blend their holidays and their worship with the Celtics. And so what they did was they kind of meshed this bobbing for apples, the apple tree with the bobbing with the suitor ritual, and it became bobbing for apples, where again, you would have females and males, their hands tied, they would be, um, apples would be bobbing in water in um, like a vat or a wooden barrel, now it's metal barrels or metal, metal um, round containers, and the first female and male to bite into the apple and bring it up, they would be married. In Scotland, it's called um, duking, which I thought is kind of fun, duking. This is actually an oil painting from 1833 from Daniel MacLeese, and it's called Snap Apple Night. And this is inspired from Blarney, Ireland from 1832 at a snap apple evening that he attended. And you can see the festivities that are going inside this home. And they've got the, the apples and the snap apples and just the revelry of celebrating Halloween. Food. 
and candy is its own separate category, by the way. So food is also associated with Halloween. And so we have soul cakes. And so soul cakes date back to 1200 AD when people made these expensive cakes, the round, small round little cakes that would have luxurious ingredients in them. And they made the soul cakes to distract roaming ghosts. So if you had a ghost or a spirit who was roaming around your house, they would sniff this cake and be distracted and then they wouldn't do any bad things to the people at the house or in the community on All Hallows Eve on Halloween night. And so the origins actually varies as to the true origin story. And there's um, multiple versions, but the two that I found most fascinating was that in Britain, soul cakes <laughs> were kind of like a lottery system. So there would actually be some bad ones, some burnt ones, some undercooked ones, the ones that people didn't want. And if you got, if you picked that soul cake, then your crops would fail. <laughs> Again, no pressure. And then the other origin story is that they were made to appease the evil spirits, to distract them. Later, when Catholicism was coming into Great Britain and they were trying to get away from Halloween and the pagan aspects of it, the mischievous aspects also, or the um, grotesque or the superstitious, all of them being separate categories, not identifying them all together as one, um, the Catholics started handing out um, soul cakes to beggars and beggars would go door to door. So we're now seeing the start of this trick or treat tradition. So beggars are going door to door, knocking on the door and they would be singing a soul cake, a soul cake, have mercy on all Christian souls for a soul cake. And so it became like this barter system where if you gave me a soul cake, then your soul was saved. Candy, and I took a screenshot of this because um, because time was running out when I was putting together the PowerPoint, and I had I had to get it going. And so, candy is very much ensconced in the tradition of Halloween and the giving out of candy. And it evolved, right? It evolved from giving out the soul cakes, giving out the items that the house made, to us now going and buying candy. And there's a reason for that that I will talk about when we get to the true crime section. But I took this screen capture because I'm fascinated with it. And so two years ago in 2019, I wrote a blog on the hauntedlibrarian.com, which is my blog site. And I was talking about the most popular Halloween candy. What was the most popular Halloween candy? Purchased, give it out and um, the candy you saw after from 2019. And so I typed it in today to see where we've moved, right? And so this image actually shows the most popular Halloween candies in America via Instacart. So Instacart is a service where you can order your groceries. Someone will pick out your groceries, pick them. Um, you purchase them. You either go and pick them up or you can get them for delivery service. And so geographically, you can look and see where you are and the most popular Halloween candy. And there should be like an asterisk. This is the Halloween candy that people are buying. This is not the Halloween candy people want. And so if you look real closely for Georgia, um, because I automatically thought myself as a Georgian when I looked at it and it's Starburst. And I'm like, Starburst? I don't want Starburst. No. Starburst is an inexpensive candy that you can purchase. So of course I'm gonna buy it through Instacart and give it out. And so this image, very deceptive, right? Texas, Sour Patch, Patch Kids, because it's an inexpensive candy to give out. And if I go, let me go back here, if I can find it, that's not it. My Zoom, I don't know if it's gonna pull it up. Of course, I'm tempting the fate, right, by doing this. Um, so here's this where I went, and this is Travel and Leisure Magazine. And so this is the America's Top Candy Cravings. These are the candies that we want for Halloween. And number one is peanut M&Ms. Number two is M&Ms. Number three is Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Number four is Hershey's Milk Chocolate. Five is Twizzlers. Six is Snickers. Seven is Kit Kat. 
Eight is candy corn, which there's, you know, a hot debate on Reddit on whether candy corn is actually candy. Number nine is Sour Patch Kids, and then number 10 is um, Gold Bears. And you can see a trend there, right? Um, people like chocolate, chocolate. So candy, we've evolved. Rituals, there are a lot of rituals tied in and embedded with Halloween. And so three of them that stand out are again, <laughs> all tied to who your husband is because think about it right um, in Great Britain it's getting cold you're sitting by the fire if you are unattached you're unmarried what else are you thinking about and so one ritual for finding a suitor was that females after the snap apple game you would eat the apple but you weren't eating the peels you would peel the apple and then you would eat the apple um, inside and then you would toss the apple peels behind you and they would land splat on the ground. And then you would look and you would scrutinize to see how they arranged themselves into the initials of who's going to be your husband. Not subjective at all, right? Um, that's sarcasm. Deeply subjective, right? To figure out who it is, but hey, you know, it's cold. The next ritual is, a, um, Females were encouraged to create this sugary concoction where they would blend hazelnuts, nutmeg, and walnuts. And on Halloween night, October 31st, they would eat this and then they would dream. And the man that they dreamt of would be their husband. And then fortune tellers in Scotland advised females to make a list of who her suitors were and identify a hazelnut for each of the suitors and then toss them into the roaring fire. And then whichever hazelnut did not burn to ash or did not pop, that was the one that was gonna be her husband. I love this, this rich tradition. But then we also have superstitions tied with Halloween. And so one of the symbols of superstitions for Halloween, black cats. So cats in general. Cats in general were thought to be bearers of the Black Death, the plague. And so um, they were thought to be the ones who were spreading the plague. And so tragically, large numbers of them were killed for no reason, no reason at all, because they were not what spread the Black Death. But during the Pilgrim's time, when the British came over and came to Plymouth, those were the um, people who came over and spread the rumor, spread the superstition that the cat was the witch's familiar. And then we have owls. This originates from medieval Europe, way back when, where if you heard an owl hoot in the middle of the night, then someone you know was going to die. And this one, is if you break it down and you think about it, well, first of all, owls are active at night. So that's the only time they're gonna really hoot is at night. And um, the hoot of the owl really means it's searching for food and it's out and it that's it's time where it's active. So of course it's gonna hoot. So, um, but what's interesting is that when on Twitter, someone was, posting about how, you know, did you grow up with these superstitions? And, and I didn't really think about it until I was putting together the PowerPoint and it was like, wait a minute, that's what my mom told me, right? If you heard the hoot of the owl three times, someone was gonna die. And her mother told her that, and it was passed down through generations. Then we have the symbol of the jack-o'-lantern. So the jack-o'-lantern was originally turnips, beets, or potatoes. And think about it, those are, there's, those are small vegetables. And so carving really wasn't as intricate as it is today. But the Irish actually brought this tale over when they came over from during the Irish potato famine is they didn't have pumpkins in Ireland. And so pumpkins weren't a fruit for them until they came over to the United States and they see these pumpkins and they're huge and you can carve them and you can be very intricate. And so that's where we get the jack-o'-lanterns and it actually stems from a folktale. And the folktale is Stingy Jack. It's an old Celtic folktale of a man named Jack 
who liked to trick the devil. And so one time Jack was thirsty and he decided that he wanted to have a drink with the devil in the pub. And so he invited him to come have a drink with him. But of course, Jack was stingy and Jack didn't want to pay. And so he actually convinced the devil to turn himself into a coin so that he can use that coin to pay. And then the devil could then turn back into himself and all would be good and they would get a free drink. Well, Jack was stingy and he decided he wanted to keep the coin, but he also wanted to trap the devil. And so he put the coin inside his pocket and he put it beside a silver cross, knowing that or believing that the devil would be trapped inside the coin if it was near that silver cross. Over time, the devil was able to break free and became the devil himself again. The second time Jack tricked him was that he tricked the devil into climbing a fruit tree for a piece of fruit. And so when the devil went up the tree, Jack drew a cross on the tree so that the devil was captured and that he was captured in the tree and he couldn't come down and he was stuck. The devil grew very tired of Jack's tricks. One day, Jack died. And God decided he didn't want a trickster like Jack in heaven. So he forbade him to enter. And the devil was mad that he kept being tricked by Jack. And so he told him he couldn't come into hell. So instead, the devil sent him out every night with a burning piece of coal. And so what Jack would do was he would put break down the coal pieces and he would put them inside these car these um, turnips, beets, and potatoes, and they would light fires, and that would give him his path. It would light his way, so that he traveled the world endlessly with these lanterns. And so, the Jack and Lantern started out as Jack of the Lantern, and it's shortened to Jack and Lantern. And now we have them in pumpkins because pumpkins are larger again and we like to carve them. Dressing up, costumes. We kind of think that costumes have been a relatively new tradition for Halloween. And um, they've evolved definitely from, I remember growing up in the, you know, the plastic face mask with the plastic dress plastic bag you put on that we went trick-or-treating with but actually dressing up has goes all the way back to Samhain times the Celtics actually dressed up when they were having these bonfires and so they would dress up to have these bonfires to ward off the evil spirits and ghosts and it dates back over 2,000 years ago when Pope Gregory moved All Saints Day to November 1st the Catholic Church was trying to get rid of Halloween. Um, they didn't want people celebrating Halloween because the people who were celebrating Halloween were Wiccans, they were pagans, and they were trying to bring them into the Catholic Church. And so the Catholics, what they did was on All Souls Day, is what they called their day, they would dress up as angels and saints and, the de and different devils, which I find kind of interesting because that's a little dark. Um, but it didn't catch on. People still wanted Halloween. And so we have Halloween, the Irish bring it over to the United States, but colonial New England really denied the Halloween celebration because Puritans, right? Puritans, there's some great Halloween movies out there, some hot horror movies about the beliefs, think of Salem witch trials. And so they did not want Halloween. And so they kind of they forbid it. And so there wasn't any dressing up except for in Maryland and then the South, the Southern colonial America, American states dressed up. But again, it wasn't until 1845 to 1852 when we have the Irish potato famine, when these Irish immigrants come over and then Halloween starts kind of taking hold in the United States. And it wasn't quickly. It, it took a long time for it to actually become this holiday, but it didn't become this holiday in like 1980. It was actually started in the 1800s, the late 1800s. When we get to 1900s, Halloween is taking over. But in the late 1800s, 
there was this rejection of the evil or the grotesque or the horror of it. And so communities wanted a more docile Halloween. And so what they wanted was they wanted to make it more of a community event, like a, a fate and have it tamed. And so they would have these Halloween parties. So there would be food, games and dressing up. But again, it's this merging of all of these cultures in America that make it what it is today. So costumes in the 1920s and 30s, the gavel was coming down in the United States. No superstitions, nothing about the devil, nothing about evil, nothing about the grotesque. And it was supposed to be more of the tamed Halloween celebration. And so Americans were encouraged to limit their superstitious activities. No more superstitions, right? Um, you were going, it was going to be more of a pure event. But by the 1950s, Americans were tiring of that. And so by the 1950s, we actually see communities not having these parties because by then we've got urban sprawl. We have communities start um, subdivisions. We have subdivisions with homes. People are moving away from city centers and kind of building up their housing communities. And so they don't have this community center to have the parties with. And so this is when the children start going door to door for trick or treating because it was easier, it was faster, it was cheaper. And so the tamed costumes, actually the sexy costume came in the 1970s, really, when there was this explosion of the sexy costume because it grew out of the 1960s with the sexual revolution, which again, this is another fascinating aspect. If you look at the history of what's going on, then you can actually see the trajectory of Halloween and, and the timeline. Halloween is ensconced in our pop culture, right? Um, because we love it. And so haunted houses. Haunted houses have been around for quite a bit, quite a bit. Um, in 1802, actually, Marie Tussaud opened her wax museum, the Chamber of Horrors debuted. And so that started people thinking that we could have haunted houses. We could have these buildings where we could go to to explore the fright of Halloween. And also we could have it year round is where we've gotten to now. But in 1918 in Lip Hook, England on the fairground, that was the first ghost house, which was a haunted house. And I have a typo there I need to fix. Um, so that was our first haunted house designation. And it was a ghost house on a fairground. And then in America during the Great Depression, not soon, not that far after, parents were looking for cheap entertainment because there, there wasn't money, but we, they still wanted to celebrate. They still wanted the children to have a good, good fun evening. And so they started having these very simple haunted houses. And one of the reasons why they did this was they wanted to avoid vandalism that took place, you know, the, the naughty mischief that would take place on October 31st um, as the excuse to vandalize. And so parents started these haunted houses and they were called Trail of Terror. So they wouldn't have the people um, and the kids, the neighborhood kids inside the home, but they would do something simple outside the home. And then it became inside the home really in 1969 when Disneyland opened the Haunted Mansion ride, which is one of its most favorite and most popular rides. And I, th I think it was like 82,000 people rode it a day when it debuted because people loved it so much. And so haunted houses started sprouting up during October as a fundraiser. So nonprofit organizations like the United States, excuse me, Junior Chamber, which is also known by the name the JCs, they were the most successful at it. They actually published a how-to guide on how to create a haunted house that was profitable. And organizations, nonprofits made a lot of money until they didn't, until tragedy struck. The Haunted Castle, 1984. 
1984 at Six Flags Great Adventures Haunted Castle in New Jersey caught fire. And um, it caught fire on May 11th, 1984. It actually wasn't the original building on that site, the original ride. The first ride was a haunted house. And I think it actually was called Haunted House. And then it was disassembled and this plywood structure with highly flammable material was built in its place in like 1978, 1979, and it was called the Haunted Castle. And on that night, May 11th, and again, now we see the haunted castles are becoming, the haunted attractions are year round, year round because they're profitable. And on that night, a fire erupted and it actually spread rapidly through the air, condition, air conditioning um, unit through the ductwork. And again, highly flammable material. Eight people died, seven people were injured. And the aftermath of this included civil lawsuits where Six Flags paid millions of dollars. And also what came about from this was stricter enforcement of these attractions. And so the nonprofit organizations kind of got squeezed out of the market because they couldn't financially create or go by these enforcements, the regulations. And so they stopped holding these haunted houses. And now we have for-profit businesses that run these haunted houses. And, and it's interesting because next Halloween, look, looking a year in advance, one of the programs that I pitched for ghost education was how to set up a haunted house. And if you want money from it, because the liability on having a haunted house is expensive. It's very expensive. And the court cases for the haunted houses, it's, it's just not something that you really should go into. But the lure again is the money because a successful for-profit haunted house can earn $3 million a year, just the, the one the one house. And here the industry, just haunted houses, haunted attractions generates $300 million each year. So think about that $9 billion figure for the second most popular holiday. And you see here where this is 300 million. So that nine, 9 billion figure is a lot higher. And this is not COVID years, right? Um, COVID, the two years we've been in the pandemic are skewing numbers. And so I'm not using those in, in the figures. So here's a picture, two pictures. The, this is not from the graphics of Gecko Gals, um, is the picture of the Haunted Castle before when it looked like before the May 11th fire and then underneath that is the control room of it. Tragic, tragic fire. So let's get into horror movies, horror movies, right? I love horror movies. Horror movies are my favorite movies to watch. I love horror movies. And there isn't really a distinction or a line to, um, just to, um, to be able to say, well, what is a Halloween movie compared to a horror movie? Because a lot of horror movies come out at Halloween time because we like to be frightened and so forth. But is it really a Halloween movie? So for instance, Jaws, is Jaws a Halloween movie? I say yes, because I love Jaws. It's like a top five movie for me, but is it really a Halloween movie? I don't know, I think that's debatable. But horror movies, horror movies are incredibly profitable um, as a genre itself. And so horror movies, again, are not a modern invention, modern day invention. Horror movies started at the beginning of the motion picture industry over in Europe. And so we have the horror movie, I have a collage here of modern horror movies and I'm pitching out to you, what is the most profitable horror movie ever? And profitability would be defined as the net money after the expenses were taken out. So some of you might be thinking Pennywise it, right? Broke records when it came out. And I can tell you that one of the reasons why I went when it came out that weekend was because we had a snow day coming up in, in Atlanta. And so 
classes were canceled. My teaching classes were canceled. My daughter's classes were canceled. And I'm like, hey, you want to go to the movie and see it? Sure. And so we ended up at it. We didn't get snow, but we watched the movie, like 10 o'clock movie with like half the high school. Well, not half the high school, but back before COVID, it was a very full theater. So I can tell you, it is not the answer, right? So think about it. Well, it has to be a movie that didn't cost a lot of money to make, but made a load of money in return. And if you're thinking of Blair Witch um, Project, you used to be right. You used to be right. Because it used to be the number one most profitable horror movie. But it's not anymore. 2009, a little film shot with $15,000 in his house, which actually sold a few years ago. I wrote a blog about it. Most profitable movie, Paranormal Activity, 2009. It earned, so it's not, it didn't gross, um, or I mean it grossed, it didn't net. It earned $193.4 million worldwide its opening weekend. But it has spawned a $400 million franchise. That is the most popular horror movie. I didn't say or ask you which was the best horror movie, the best horror movie. But I'm gonna ask you that now. What's the best horror movie? What is the most popular horror movie? Think about it. You know the answer. Most of you have seen this movie. It would be The Exorcist. The Exorcist is the most popular horror movie based on Rotten Tomatoes. And um, are horror movies based on fact? Yeah, a lot of them are. Actually, most movies are based on fact because the truth is stranger than fiction. But The Exorcist from 1973, the original, was based on the book, the novel by William Peter Blatty, who also wrote the screenplay. It was loosely based on a possession case an exorcism with the exorcism of um, he went the pseudonym um, Roland Doe or Robbie Manheim, which was document, documented by Father William S. Bowdern. So yes, The Exorcist. And I actually have a listing of different movies that were based on, and I don't have slides for them because I was like, well, I'm not going to flip through the slide, but if, think about it. So October 31st, Halloween movies based on some type of horrible crime or a paranormal phenomena. So we have The Exorcist being Possession. We have The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, 1974, which that was that would be the one that I would recommend you watch, is um, loosely based on the serial killer, Ed Gein, who actually was the inspiration for two other, at least two other movies, Psycho, Hitchcock Psycho from 1960, also loosely based on Ed. And then 1974, Deranged. Then we have A Nightmare on Elm Street, 1984. That was loosely based on an experiment, I believe in Japan, where people died. They would, were physically healthy, but their dreams, the power of the mind brought about their death. Child's Play, oh, Chucky, Chucky, 1988, loosely based on the story of a voodoo priestess who placed a curse um, to get back at painter and um, Robert Eugene Otto and his family. This movie I have not seen, The Girl Next Door, 2007, and I'm not sure I want to see it. I'm, I, I didn't... I don't like it when it's kids, maybe. I mean, I liked it, but um, but this is where Sylvia Likens um, was killed by Gertrude Banis Zuski in 1965. And then The Right from 2011 about exorcist father Gary Thomas. The Right was a good movie. I liked it. I think I actually wrote a review of it on um, my blog. Last year and the year before, I, I've done horror movies to watch in October. I've gotten away from it this year, still watching them, but I'm more into true crime, true crime. True crime on October 31st. We have some October 31st true crime. And so I'm, uh, murders have happened on October 31st since the beginning of time, right? Um, and there are so many of them that I'm actually just going to talk about a few, not that many. 
And the first one I'm going to talk about is Candyman. Candyman. The, he's the reason. He's the, the man, also known as the man who killed Halloween. He's the reason why we have packaged candy now. When I was growing up, people in the neighborhood, they would make candied apples and give those out. They would make um, the original Reese's Pieces and give, or not um, Reese's Pieces, but um, Rice Krispie Treats and give those out, but no more, no more. And it's because Ronald O'Brien decided he needed money. He was deeply in debt and he had a life insurance policy on his son, Timothy. And in 1978, he poisoned pixie sticks. And so Timothy went out and he trick-or-treated. He came home and the father, Ronald, was like, I have some candy here for you. He gave him the pixie stick. Timothy died. And um, he is the candy man, not the inspiration for the movie by Sam Raimi, candy man, by the way. But he's the reason why parents take their candy to hospitals to get x-rayed. That's why we're kind of circling back to that community aspect where families, parents take children to safe places like grocery stores or malls and things so that candy is packaged. It's all because of this man. 1978, he was sentenced to death, death by lethal injection. This is a picture of the apartments um, in Los Angeles, California. And this one is a story where you're like, oh, I know why he, di why he died, but there's a little twist. So Peter and Betty Fabiano were handing out candy to trick-or-treaters at their home. Excuse me, it got late. They decided to go to bed, turned off the lights. They were going into bed and the doorbell rang. Peter went and thinking that it was one more late trick-or-treater went to the door, he opened it, and there was a woman standing there with a gun in a paper bag, and she shot him. She killed him instantly. Instantly, he died. And so the police were trying to figure out why this happened, why this happened. And so they tracked down Goldine Pizer, or Pizer, Goldine Pizer, as the murderer. She was convinced to kill Peter by Joan Rabel. Joan was actually in a sexual relationship with the wife, Betty Fabiano. There's your twist. They were in a relationship and Joan decided that it was faster and easier to murder Peter than for Betty to get a divorce. Yes, both Joan and Goldine served time in jail I believe less than 10 years each, which I find um, I'm a little disappointed with, um, but I haven't read the case to know why the sentencing was so low. They served their time and actually were released. The police could never place Betty into that circle of conspiracy. And so she was never arrested or charged with the crime of the murder of her husband, Peter. And this happened in 1957, Los Angeles, California. Now we're turning to unsolved true crime. This is, um, and, and again, the popularity of true crime, th that's just what I'm captivated by at night. I watch all the channels and so forth. This is um, Arpana Janaga. And I, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing her name. She was 24 years old and she lived in Redmond, Washington, and she was a software engineer. She lived in an apartment building and the apartment building had a multi-apartment Halloween party where people came and they went from apartment to apartment to celebrate Halloween. The last time that she was seen was November 1st at 3 a.m. and she disappeared. A couple days later, her body was found and she had been murdered. And the interesting about this case is that DNA from her apartment identified three potential suspects. So three men were identified through their DNA to have possibly committed the crime. The police focused on one man, 
and they decided not to pursue the other two. They brought charges against this one man. He went to trial. He was found guilty. He was incarcerated. And then it was found that he actually wasn't the person who committed the crime. There is a new murder podcast called Suspect that actually profiles this murder. And the, the podcast is not who committed the crime. It's more about the evidence and the police involvement and just, it, it's very complex, it's very layered. And the interesting thing about this podcast is the Redmond Police Department actively are actually um, act, actively a part of the podcast. The um, two producers, two men who are doing the podcast reached out to the police department thinking that the police um, department police would not be interested to be on the podcast and they they were wrong they they want to help solve this crime solve this crime so that's the end of my show man i went fast i'm a quick talker um again most of the graphics here are supplied by getco Ga um, gals which is a digital design company located on etsy full disclaimer i have not been paid um for having them in here. I just love their graphics. And um, I am going to be a design member in 2022. I can't believe it's 2022. And here we are. Here we are. So Philip, are you, hey, there you are. I'm here. Now, I can not see if you were like trying to stop me for any questions or anything. So I do apologize. I am sorry. Um, how, how do I get the large screen here? Uh, can you stop screen sharing? Oh, no, you can't, can you? Not you if can't. you want me on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, well, that's okay. Um, I may be able to change it, though. I'm flipping through. Yeah, you're large. Yeah, this is better that way. Okay. Um, so in the first grade, <laughs> for the Halloween parade, I wanted to be a witch. This was before we were gender fluid or non <laughs> all that stuff. All I know is I wanted to be a witch and I wasn't having anything else. So um, my mom had this black dress that was like came to her knees, but on me, it was like to the floor. <laughs> so, um, so mom took me to Woolworths, got me a witch's hat. I wore that black dress and that hat. I got on the school bus. <laughs> Good for you. I you wore know, that thing. true, though, in terms of like, there were warlocks back then. Nobody said a thing. I mean, it was just like I was a yeah. witch. I mean, that's, you know, it was hysterical now. I look back. At, there's a picture of it somewhere with me standing at the front door getting ready to leave for school, but I, I don't know where it is. I've seen it, but I don't know where it is. Now everybody stop laughing. <laughs> no, you got to dig that out. You got to find that. Because I get when you when you had the uh, picture of Jack that looked like the little. I said, <laughs> "Oh my gosh, that's me in the first grade." <laughs> <sighs> I know, and, and it's just um, God, I love Halloween. Like I, I would love to turn the camera around so that you can you can see my display shelves, but I'm still unpacking. Um, but like, well, here, let me get the material. Have you seen this? You posted us uh, some fabric the other day that was just so cool. So this is Alexander Henry. Oh right my gosh, that is so fantastic. Oops, and, slow it down. Yeah, right there. <sighs> yeah, I'm gonna put the I'm gonna put incorporate this into my journals. That is cool. And then and this I got at um, Joanne's Fabric carries them, but just like every every designer, you know, there's a they have a collection that goes to like Joanne's, and then a collection that goes to fabric stores. And so I'm gonna order the other exotic Halloween fabrics, but this one I love. Oh wow, that's really hot. Uh, she holding a what a brain? Yeah. Yep. That is really cool. Isn't this gorgeous? He's wow. Just, it's just well, no, beautiful. I, I don't do tattoos, but that would make some really cool tattoos, those, those images. This would make a great skirt. Yeah. You know, like a full skirt. And so I just. Or me a shirt. Mm hmm Oh, yeah, right? Instead, So instead of dressing up like in a costume, dress up like, oh, I think that's great. Great. So, idea. um. 
Now, that's funny. I have always been absolutely terrified of haunted houses as in the <laughs> pay to get scared mm -hmm. haunted houses. And I have friends say, oh my gosh, you go to ghost hunting and spend the night in haunted prisons, but you won't go in these things. I was like, I would rather be with real ghosts than people coming at me with fake machetes and yeah. chainsaws. That scares the crap out of me. I don't know. It's just I'm the it, same way. I don't want to be scared that way. It just freaks. Even though I know it's fake, it's, it's just freaky to me. Well, it's because it's the, it's the jump scare, right? And so that's yeah. why a lot of horror movies, I don't really watch a lot of the um, slasher movies because it's all in the jump scare. And that to me is not a story. That's just, you know, getting your quick scream yeah. kind of thing. And so that's what I think about in terms of the um, haunted houses. And then the other thing, um, People ask me all the time if I do haunted tours. So we're going back to New Orleans in October or December, rather, hopefully to figure out my daughter's dorm and, oh, and all yeah. that, get her moved. And people are like, oh, well, have you, you know, have you done the haunted tour? And most of the haunted tours I will not do because again, it's jump scares. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's, um, Patrick Burns is probably the only one I trust over in Savannah, he and Marley only because he he's a you know he's an yeah. investigator and a researcher and knows his stuff but most of them it's all money yeah all and then what little bit of the truth is in the stories is so exaggerated usually on those tours that they have the facts yeah. so askew that it's, you you lost the true meaning of the story but um oh yeah well and that's why i didn't on the horror movies yeah. I didn't list or I didn't discuss um, The Conjuring or, oh. or, or The Nun or Annabelle because yeah. those, I, this, and I didn't put Amityville because I'm sorry, I don't believe Amityville. I, I, <laughs> no, I, sorry, DeFeo yeah. killed his family because he didn't like them. <laughs> it wasn't and because he was, he was possessed. Yeah. I think he was um, probably high as a kite on something too. Yeah, right. And so, it, and I don't believe the Lutzes. I think they they were in over their head. And so, I don't I don't talk about those um, as being the influence, but like, um, but like the Exorcist or the other ones, because there there is a little bit of truth, right? But you yeah. know what was interesting also when I um, was looking up and researching the Halloween horror movies and so forth. Um, oh, crap, Travis. Travis, the UFO abduction um, uh, in West Virginia. Oh gosh, why can't I think of it? Not the, um, the three guys, the hunters. Is it? They were they were the um, lumbermen. There were like five or six of them. Okay. Yeah. Um, that one was actually on the list for Halloween horror movies, and I'm like, huh. so, I, and I guess that just opens up another conversation of UFOs. Are UFOs abduction stories halloween stories because i don't think they are no but, i mean technically i think ufos fall into paranormal because they can't mm -hmm. be explained well most of them can't yeah oh there's a question stephanie wants to know if you had to choose one halloween story as your favorite which one would you choose as in like a tradi the one of the tradition stories and she said one of your Choose one Halloween story. Yeah. Hmm. I'm always good about bashing the Puritans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And how they've kind of deprived us. Um, I I I like the Stingy Jack story because um that, if you, that's fascinating. If, yeah. If you don't if you don't research the whole story, because the first few stories that I saw online are very abbreviated, and it just said that he tricked the devil, but then the devil made him walk the earth. And I'm like, well then why did the devil make him walk the earth if he kept tricking him? Because wouldn't he be mad? But yeah. then when you you dig deeper to find out, well, God said no, you can't come to heaven because we don't need that trickster activity. Yeah. And um, and I like that. Yeah, that's oh. very interesting. You got, and it's tied in with the with the gods too, right? But it also put him roaming the earth forever. Yeah, right. Exactly. Like a ghost. Can't go up or can't go down. <laughs> no, you can't. You can't. Um, do you remember when you lived here, the uh, Netherworld haunted house? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's uh, 
like supposedly just amazing and huge and cost a fortune to get in. But a few years ago, I was driving home from work. It was dark. And do you remember OnStar, that service that the yes. cars used to have, you know, I guess before the cell phones really, but if you had got in trouble, you could hit OnStar button and talk to somebody. Well, <laughs> they're, they played commercials, OnStar commercials, and mm -hmm. about somebody being trapped and how they got help. Well, this came on and it said, hi, this is Betty with OnStar. How can I help you? Oh, I've, I've broken down. I've got a flat. I'm out on a dirt road, blah, blah, blah. And she said, can you send somebody to help? Sure, we'll be able to send you, blah, blah, blah. And then she hear her say, there's somebody outside. I was like, it went on and on. And I thought it was a real on star commercial and at, and you hear her screaming bloody murder at the end and then it's like netherworld oh, oh my gosh it. it was the best commercial for that haunted house i have ever heard it had me like pulling over on the side of the road shaking oh wondering and, and it's interesting because when you look at the articles like the business articles talking about the industry of the for-profit haunted houses they always bring up netherworld as, as being oh, yeah. um, the one that does it right, it, that's incredibly successful financially and, and so forth. But the hot, but the, um, but you bring up, I wrote a blog a couple of years ago about Halloween commercials and because they are just so clever and, and I love them. Yeah. And it's just like, and the one, like the one with Casper watching TV with the, you know, the young couple sitting on their couch and it, and, it, and it just shows how there was this fight and there still is that fight in um, the Bible belt Yes. on Halloween, resisting it. That is the devil's holiday. It is not the devil's holiday, right? Um, Halloween's not mentioned in the Bible. Um, it predates the Bible. No. It's just, you know, and th there's this fight and it's just so satisfying to see how pop culture has embraced it and incorporates Halloween into mainstream commercials. Yes. And it's kind of like the people who don't celebrate Halloween are the ones, they're the, they're the ones who are like the strange ones <laughs> because, um, and that's why, I, and I, and it's, it's hard to nail down money in terms of the industry to say that it's the second most popular holiday. I would honestly, I, if, if I was thinking of all the categories and breaking it down and thinking about how inclusive Halloween is, yeah, I think it's actually more popular financially and popularity wise than Christmas because well, you know you Jewish people can celebrate Halloween they don't celebrate Christmas you've got yep. different different religious groups that don't really celebrate Christmas but Halloween's for everybody right and I think that they need to delineate and separate Christmas if are they looking at Christmas as the religious holiday yeah. in terms of money or exactly. Christmas as the season and the season encompasses Kwanzaa, it incorporates Hanukkah, it incorporates yeah. all of these other holidays and traditions. And I honestly, I, I think I could debate it that Halloween is actually the most popular holiday. Yeah, I would think so. You have just as many movies in right. the Halloween genre as you do in the Christmas holiday season movies. Yeah. Um, here's, a, here's a question, um, Karen. Um, have you heard of Mrs. Krebs? She created Halloween parties for her town in order to divert children's attention from being wild. Wild. They were ruining her flowers and she was fed up. She thinks this was in the Depression era. Was it in Depression or was it England? Um, she, thought, she was not sure. She thought it was Depression. I era. have heard of her. Um, but yeah, in D Depression era, it would make sense, right? Because um, they just, they, and again, think about it, right? They're out, they're not distracted by television, by the internet, by cell phones, where um, we, they're just looking for fun, especially if it's a weekend Halloween. Yes, absolutely. And um, trampling through, and um, that was one of the things we were always 
careful and when our daughter was younger and did trick-or-treating you know she, we were like don't run through the yard use the driveway use the sidewalk yes. because you don't want to trample but i could see a mrs Krabs. i'm gonna look into that so i, yeah. I have not but now she karen you have piqued my curiosity but it is sad i mean when i was a kid our neighborhood even if we didn't know the neighbors well, like on a street over, we still, we would go in their house. Mm -hmm. It's like, come in, come in, you know, because the dad would be on this, in his bark lounger and he, you'd have to show the costumes and they oh, would yeah. give you rice, uh, not rice ball, uh, popcorn balls, all yep. this homemade <laughs> stuff. I mean, we loved all that. We never once ever worried about somebody killing us or poisoning us or we just didn't. I mean, it may have occurred somewhere back in the 70s, 70s but well, um, it wasn't. I mean, we never thought about anything like that. It's so sad. You didn't. And then then the razor blade started started coming in. Yeah. And then, you know, taking and growing up, my parents never took us to the hospital to x-ray the candy. They no, that was scrutinized yeah. and looked at the candy and um, and so forth. But um, in 2013, there was a young man, he was 19, Anthony Seabell. He went to a Halloween party and was in his costume and was found murdered and it's an unsolved murder. Oh, wow. And, um, yeah, it's just crazy because I, I think back of how we did just went door to door and then we also had to go to my grandmother's um they both lived in a trailer park community and we you know we didn't just have to visit them like the entire yeah. row we had to go from mobile home to mobile home <laughs> because of all of the retirees whose grandchildren yeah. up north and so we were like you know <laughs> be shown off oh yeah we had to do everything. but um, it was fun Michelle wants to know what is your favorite scary movie? My favorite um, scary movie is Poltergeist. Really? The original. Oh, yeah. You know, because um, some of the comments when you were talking about exorcism and things, that Poltergeist movie was plagued with problems, mm -hmm. paranormal, Death. possibly in nature during the filming of that. I know. Gosh, didn't the daughter, the one, uh, oh, the brunette daughter, wasn't she murdered? No, the, um, yeah. Um, oh gosh, she was a crime writer. Um, she she was nineteen, I think, early twenties. Yeah. Uh, her boyfriend murdered her. Yes. And then yes. Heather, the blonde, blonde. Yeah. girl, died on the operating table. For something uh, simple, wasn't it? Like a yeah, it was like gallbladder surgery or something. Uh, it, was it was undiagnosed. Simple. And then um, a Native American Indian yeah. attached to the filming, I believe he died. Yeah. And um, and I think what I like about it is, you know, has some truth to it. It's based on the. Um, the research that the different universities, notably the Rhine Center at Duke did. And yeah. there isn't a lot, it's not a slasher movie. And that's why I like it, because it's not yeah. a slasher movie. It's why I like Jaws, because Bruce the Mechanical Shark kept breaking down and Spielberg was behind, he was yeah. the delays in the money and he was like, cut the shark, <laughs> right? But I think it's a more effective movie. Yeah. Um, and then, I, and I haven't seen the new Scream movie. My daughter told me that it's getting good reviews. Really? Like, yeah, I like Scream, the first Scream. Um, yeah, I, I, that one was interesting, but then yeah. afterwards it was like, yeah, we we got this already. We yeah. Well, it's kind of like so. I never saw the um, Poltergeist two, and I never saw the remake. They and were. Jaws two, I saw, and it's bad. Jaws three D yeah. is worse. Poltergeist, the one where they're in the high rise, that was just ridiculous. That one was. But the screens actually, the sequels hold up enough until four. And so, by four, I'm done. I'm like, Kevin, I think it's Kevin Williamson, um, who was actually a, an executive producer on Halloween, another franchise. Um, Halloween's the most financially successful 
horror movie franchise, but it's because it's got like a zillion. Forty of them. I mean, yeah. There's um, plus they got the T-shirt. There's so much, so many products out of those Halloween movies. Yeah. Um, now the Exorcist. I have never been able to watch that start to finish ever, ever in my entire thirty-two years of life. Wow, um, really? I can't. It freaks me out. But um, what was interesting, I, I can't remember, when, I think it was the anniversary of it or something they were showing on TV when it opened, how the lines were around the block and around the building and, and oh, yeah. people were passing out and they were having to call, have ambulances come to the theater and all that. I think some of those videos are on YouTube of like the premieres of The Exorcist when I mean, people were like falling out in the aisles. It was so terrifying. Yeah, and, and now we're so desensitized to it. Oh, yeah. And um, yeah, it's just, um, I watched it. I, I watched it a number of times start to finish, but I do not watch it now, it, which is interesting because I can't really say why I don't. It, it might just be because there's so many other horror movies that I want to try Yeah. Um, to watch it. Um, but it was um, first one nominated for an Academy Award. Harmony. Oh, really? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, back to Poltergeist. That the the original one. Um, what was the woman that played the mother? Um, oh, um, Joe Beth Williams. Yes, she apparently, if it's true, said she didn't realize that the skeletons that were popping up from the ground in the mud they had used some real skeletons do you know anything about that i don't um she said she had no idea until they were doing it that they had used real skeletons now that right there could have added a little problem to the energy of making that movie i would think yeah. well i think there's some ethical yeah besides that where would you get them to? Uh, I, I, I've never researched that, but she, I read a quote somewhere where she said she did not realize they had used real skeletons in that scene. And in the pool. so that screaming and the, a lot of that wasn't acting, she said. So, well, I, here's my hang up. Um, like I have one hang up with Poltergeist. Yeah. So when Craig T. Nelson is sitting with the interview at the university and they're asking about the family. Yeah. Um, and I think her name, the character's name was Diane. And he said his wife, his, so his wife was 32 and the daughter is 16. And I'm doing the math and I'm like, <laughs> yeah, what? Uh, no. Uh, no. Oh, yeah. That, that's, that's, <laughs> Sorry, little, but, but no, cool. yeah. <laughs> so I always get distracted now when, when I have it, cause I have, I'm old school. So I have it on DVD and I'll put it in my DVD when I'm crafting or doing something and um, I'll have it running. And when he gets to that scene, I have to listen to it again. Like I've seen the movie over a hundred times and I'm like 32, I don't think so. <laughs> oh, um, Skip Fuller said they were medical skeletons. They were cheaper to get and use at the time rather than making prop ones would have been. Wow, okay. that is, ugh. So that's 1980. So I guess, yeah, plastics, they weren't selling the plastic skeleton um, decorations that they could go. So I could see that, but still, that would be some bad energy. Bad juju using my skeleton in a horror movie. I mean, I mean I'd mean, i love it, but some people may have not have loved it. Um, <laughs> my favorite movie, and I don't think it's, it's not really a Halloween a horror movie, but The Others with Nicole Kidman. That's the kind of movie mm -hmm. I like. There's yep. no blood and guts. There's mystery, yep. ghost, history. I loved that movie. And it's so believable in yes. terms of why the house isn't open. Uh-huh. And yep. um, you, yeah, not giving away any spoilers, but that is an awesome movie awesome and, and again right just shows that you don't need to have all of this no if it's well written and a really good story mm -hmm. which you know it's what i like but um 
people are more just more people are just visual and shock scare that, that they like I'm, I'm not i like to fear because at the end I, it dawned on me they're dead the other people are alive you know <laughs> yeah it's it's like um i see dead people um the six six cents because huh. halfway through i forget who i was seeing with i said you know, Bruce Willis hadn't changed clothes this entire movie, right? He's had the exact same thing on. Yeah. And my friend said, oh, what's that mean? I said, he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got it a lot faster than I did because, yeah. Um, yeah, that movie was awesome. And, and, I, and I think back to that one a lot also because when you have, because one of the, benefits of films is that the narrator can it tells the story and he and the narrator is unreliable and so you can't believe what the narrator is saying because the narrator is only showing you what he sees in his mind or tells you you know best light you know be, you know best stories and so forth and so you don't so after you see it and you get it you're like wait a minute we didn't see him drive a car we didn't see him walk up to the bench and sit down we didn't uh -huh. see him do all of these things because he's an unreliable narrator. Yeah. Yeah, that uh, M. Night Shyamalan, man, he, when he makes a movie, uh, it's, it's either great or it's not. <laughs> I, watched, I watched The Conjuring 3 just because I had a friend over and he likes those movies. And I mean, I laughed through most of it. Mm -hmm. I mean... I don't want to offend anybody, but I, I mean, it's, it's not my cup of tea. We'll put it that way. And Ed and Lorraine, the way they portrayed them and that was just kind of ridiculous. I mean, it was just ridiculous. And I think what's unfortunate is that um, Ed and Lorraine didn't do any investigation in England for the Enfield post Poltergeist. And by presenting a movie that says they did. Yeah takes away from the actual organization, which is still around and yeah. is, you know, one of the best in the world and does so much for the community. You're taking away their credibility yeah. and the work that they did. They did a lot. And it, just so that you can sell it, sell the name of Ed and Lorraine, yeah. right? Um, and that's the problem I have with the, the franchise yeah. is that you don't have to, you don't have to do that. And, you know, in the beginning when they, you know, based on a true story, well, that's, we all know that's not right. And because whenever I see that come up on the screen, it's like, okay, are you trying to convince me? Because I yeah. know it's not right. It, yeah. It's not true. And it's just, it, it's, um, it's a disservice to those who did the work. And yes. The case. That Inkfield case is so the witnesses vary so much in what they say. There's, you've got policemen saying it's absolutely true. I saw it up with my own eyes. Mm -hmm. Whenever, then they, you've got the ones that said the girls were faking it and, oh, that's a juicy case. And it would have been an awesome movie. And I, have you seen this, the limited series? Um, and I think it's called Enfield Poltergeist. And I think it was a BBC production. It came out of Britain. Um, did so much more for the story and, and talking about it. But it's still, it's so complex and so layered that I would rather watch that, a docu-series, yeah. than something made up where, you know, two people just flew in for publicity shot with a book and then left exactly i watched uh interesting it was an old um it was kind of like a documentary but they had actors acting out the scenes about uh, the Bor borley rectory in england if, if you guys don't know about that case that's one of the most haunted house case studies that there ever were with harry price and then several other people um but this this there was some that's sad that place burnt down, but I'd love to go where the to the where the house was and see if there's any energy. Oh, I know, right? And um, yeah, it's just make a minutes here. 
So um, does anybody else have any questions, anything they want to talk about? Let me look through here real quickly. Yep, yeah, people donate their bodies for teaching purposes. That is true, but I don't think they donate them in thinking they're going to end up in a poltergeist movie. Maybe they, are they credited as an extra? Oh my gosh. Oh. <laughs> oh, but there's, gosh, there's so much out there and so many good stories and yeah. so much um, just, like I said, Halloween is, it, it it's multi-volumes, right? Yeah. And um, and one thing that I didn't, you know, because being in America, I presume you know, wrongly, yeah. everybody celebrates Halloween, and I and I have and I ne I never really realized that Great Britain doesn't celebrate Halloween. They don't. I they never know. It's, not, it's not a um, it's not a holiday for them, and um, and it's interesting because it's slowly be creeping in because. I watch I watch a lot of British programming and Midsummer yeah, Murders. Yeah, watching Vera right now, the new season. <laughs> yeah, and shame on Vera. Are you watching the new season? Yeah. Okay, here's a tangent. They only gave us two episodes, and the rest of the season is going to be in 2022. Now, if you got a fire stick, they're all on fire stick. Oh yeah. <laughs> no, 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 they're not. They're not. The new uh, season is not. It won't. They're not. It hasn't been released yet. Oh, I've been, I've watched three of them. Okay. They're like, no, you're, you're still, you're still on the original with David Leon as her okay. sidekick. Yeah. Joe is the new guy, but anyhow, Midsummer Murders, if you're, if anybody ever is interested in seeing how England embraces the paranormal, yeah, watch Midsummer Murders because um, it's like 22 seasons. Um, yeah it's long um but in there, they have like six episodes per season so it's not like you're watching 20 ep 20 episodes per season but they weave in paranormal activity in almost every other episode and so you can see the progression of halloween oh wow um, and how it's becoming um, celebrated England, but it's not, it's not a holiday over there for them. Um, the, so interestingly enough, the Irish brought Halloween to us in the potato famine yeah. in the 1800s. We're bringing Halloween back to Great Britain for modern. Um, Kylie Borg said in Australia, they don't celebrate it either. It's only just a few that celebrate it. <laughs> because mm -hmm. of the British ties. It's not, yeah. and, um, and and it's just fascinating and maybe that's why no because my my statistic is us um yeah there's still so much growth that can be done in terms of halloween and and the ghost stories and the sharing and um they're very open to grow ghost stories they're very open to the paranormal they're very open to that yes. um curious um ask her if or I'm asking her um, yeah. if it is that way in Australia. I watch a lot of Australian TV too, <laughs> in New Zealand. Lucy Love uh, Lawless, all oh, my stars. She's oh like, gosh, she's a great actress. Uh, we would just think of her as um, what's the yes. character? Yes, um, Sheena. Uh, but but yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, they think of her in that character, but she's really good. Um, I'm, wa I'm watching, well, I watched two things. One of them, it's on Netflix or Amazon. I can't remember. It's called Midnight Mass. Hate it. You hate, did you watch it? I'm on episode six. And it's it got, only I'm going to finish it. Really freaky. Yeah. it's. When they killed the cats. I was like. Yeah, that was really gross. Um, it gets it gets really, cool. I couldn't stop watching it. It, okay. it got really gory and gross at the end, but it was, it was still good. I don't, it's not my normal cup of tea, but I really liked it. Um, and I'm watching Chapel Wait with um, uh, Adrian Brody. Is that, is that how you say his name? Yes. I think it's on Epics, but it's on my fire stick. So I don't know what real channel okay. it's on. It's really good. It's I haven't heard of that. What's that one about? Well, it's not what I thought it was about, but it's vampires, basically. Okay, Midnight Mass. Yeah, <laughs> but um, it's 
it's a creepier setting than Midnight Mass, and it's back in the 1700s. Ooh. Yeah, it's good. I enjoyed it. It's got, I've got two more episodes that got to release. Yes. Oh, Netflix. That's what um, Midnight Mass was on. Well, if you have Hulu, and this is segueing into the true crimes, if yeah. um, Only Murders in the Building with Steve Martin, Martin Short, and Selena Gomez. Yeah. Fantastic. I've watched two episodes so far. And yeah, I'm going to watch more Love of it. it after I get finished with Chapel Wake. I only have so much TV time during the week. Yeah, I know. It's that's and that's honestly why we can be choosy in our selection. Because um, the manner that I watched over the weekend with Barbara Hershey. Don't bother. No. Although I'm watching it and I'm they're sitting outside this old mansion and I realize it's Rhodes Hall in Atlanta. So they oh. filmed it there, at least the outside part. I, the inside didn't look like Rhodes Hall, but yeah, if y'all see that on um, remember if it was amazon or netflix skip it because it was just stupid yeah i now whenever whenever anybody says her name i think tiptoes through the tulips <laughs> through the tulips which my daughter uh, well, we're running 10 26 about bewitching hour um so tell everybody where they can find you they can find me, uh, and, I, and I apologize, I have not been blogging as much as I usually do because of the move and unpacking and, um, oh, which is sad. Um, I am thehauntedlibrarian.com, so it's thehauntedlibrarian.com, so is my blog, and I will be back December 22nd on Ghost Education, where I am talking about haunted Chris, um, Christmas stories, and I actually... Okay, now let me hold on a second. Let me open sure. up my paper because um, I do another one and I can show you, where is it? Haunted Christmas. Oh, and I'm also, so I'm doing Haunted Christmas um, December 22nd for Ghost Education. Yeah. And then to for a date unknown, TBA, uh -huh. for 2022, I am doing unsolved murder cases that have haunting side to them. Uh -huh. That would be good. Yes, I'm starting a, a new series um, within the blog for 2022, which will ha include an audio component, um, not a podcast, not a full podcast, um, but it will be retelling these unsolved murder mysteries that are tied to hauntings, and it's unsolved, ha um, haunted unsolved cases, case that files, will be haunted fun. unsolved case files. I thought that was some fun research. What are you doing for Halloween? Do you have plans? No. Um, in fact, I we have I have two decorations. <laughs> I have my witch and my roly poly um, jack o' lantern. He, yes. he, go, he goes like this because he's metal. That's the only thing we have on the um, walkway to the house, and that is it. We're just. All I have to do <laughs> is show people. <laughs> I know. I love it. They freak out enough. Yeah, no. one friend of mine that pet sits for me sometimes makes me shut this door when he comes over because he's terrified of Paul, but that's really fun. My team, um, Georgia Paranormal, we're going to a uh, an old jail built in 1906 on the night of the 30th, so we'll be there after midnight, so technically we'll be there on Halloween. Halloween. Is it located in Georgia? Yes, it's mm -hmm. about an hour from here, headed like north. Okay. I don't want to, well, I posted it. I posted it on our Facebook page, but it's um, it's um, on my group um, GPI page. It's yeah. um, Pickens County it. Jail. Pickens, yeah, Pickens County Jail. It was. It's so, you know you've lived here. How hard it is to get into mm -hmm. historical locations in the South. It really, really is. It's they don't want to celebrate their ghosts. They don't want a reputation as being haunted. It, it's like it's it so just, difficult. <clears throat> it's it's that Bible Belt thing. Um, but I oh, so I tried a cozy murder mystery. Yeah. And um, because I listen to audiobooks, and so it's on Audible, and it's called Mrs. Morris and the Ghost, and it's about this woman who buys a house in Salem. 
yeah. and converts it to a bed and breakfast. And the ghost of the um, young doctor, he's like in his forties, was murdered. And it's a nice, easy, cozy mur murder mystery, but it really is good. And, um, and, but it reminded me, it's like, please, cause she, cause she didn't want it, the stigma of the, the bed and breakfast being yeah, haunted. Yeah. And it's like, that's how it is in Georgia. It is so hard to get into locations. Yes. And, um, and residential hauntings are just, there's just so much liability and, it's yeah. it's just you know we just haven't uh, lately had a lot of um, intake requests for um, private home investigations. I mean we we've, we've interviewed some that have been in rental homes that could not get us written um, permission, mm -hmm. and we can't do that because of the liability. So um, yeah, I'm ready for this COVID to go away so the ghosts start acting back up so people will have us to their house. Because that's, you know, that's my, my, my passion is people with a ghost in their house. I mean, that's what I love. Yeah, no, I, I like haunted locations, but not a group adventure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you yeah know? One of my favorite places that I've, I've always, it's on my bucket list in Marietta, um, Kennesaw House. You know, they're doing for the first time in years of public ghost tours. Well, they sold out like that, but. I, I, I can't do it with amateurs. I, I can't go on a ghost tour with amateurs at this point. And um, it's difficult. Yeah. With a bunch of K2 meters going around with their cell phones and. Well, and then you always, and, and then there's the skeptic, which is, skeptics are fine. They're totally, yeah. but it, but the person is not really a skeptic. It's just somebody who just doesn't know what, why he's there. Yeah, <laughs> and so true. you have to explain everything. Right. And, and then, and it's just, um, yeah, the I just I just can't do public investigations. Yeah, can't either. So we're Stephanie on our team is she's contacted Kennesaw House and we're we're trying to get a relationship because yeah. it's it's just one of my dreams to go in there. It just I feel like there's so much that that could happen in there. It's just one of those instinctual things. I just feel like it's calling us. <laughs> oh yeah. And um, like I told you, I mean, I did it with just being there to put up a Christmas tree and had all my stuff, all my gear going and, and got some stuff. And, um, and I, and cause I was the only one on the floor because the museum is actually on the second floor. Yeah. And so I was, you know, I was talking cause I talked to myself. So, you know, I'm just talking and sitting, you know, saying if any, anything's here, anybody's here, wants to talk and, um, and got some, some stuff. Um, but, I, and, but I was only there for like two hours, Yeah. but I couldn't do a group tour there, but I'm glad they're, I'm glad they they're opening up though, because yes, uh, I'm glad they're embracing ghosts because it's a beautiful yes. museum. Yeah. Um, be, and the history is so rich there with the, you know, the great train robbery happened right yeah. outside the window. Yes. Um, and so, you know, there, it's, it's got great items and artifacts that are relatively unknown because no one yeah. goes to museums. And so it's a draw. It, it's, um, ghost tours are a money maker or can be for locations. Hey. And it's another audience to appeal to and reach out to. And that's something I wish they were more open to here is the financial aspect of it. But in the end, you've got your Bible Belt people and they don't care about that. And even though they're struggling because of COVID and donations to historic locations are down, I mean, it's just a, it's just a tough um, battle we have to try to get some of these people to open up about it. But, you know, we'll keep working. There is a, a bed and breakfast in Stone Mountain that's haunted. She even does ghost tours. We're working on trying to rent the whole place for a weekend. I think um, I might have stayed there. <laughs> yeah. 20, 20, 20 plus years ago, like 1998. And if it's the bed and breakfast we stayed at, it, it was, I loved it. Um, Stillwell House. I don't remember the name. Yeah, and, I, the, and it might have changed hands, so it might be something different. Yeah, this this lady's um, 
nice and has done a lot of ghost tours and, and things like that. And another team a few years ago, I had read their report where they had investigated it. And when they got there, the owner of the bed and breakfast hadn't arrived yet. She was coming from the store or something. And they said, oh, that's all right. We were around back talking to the little boy. And she said, what little boy? <laughs> said, we don't have a little boy around here. And they said, well, he was the one talking about he was there to help with the laundry. And she's like, mm, yeah, no, there's no little boy here. <laughs> so that, you know, that would be great to get. All right, really well, we that. are at the time where we need to end so I can have my bedtime snack and go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks everybody for watching. Yeah. We really appreciate it. Um, we hope you enjoyed it. I know I sure did and I learned a lot. You all learned that I wore my mother's black dress on the first day <laughs> for Halloween. Um, so the next um, presentation is, I wrote it down and I cannot find it. Um, <laughs> Not mine. <laughs> anyway, it's, um, I forget who it is. You would think I would make better notes. Anyway, it, I know it's on um, embracing your abilities in Reiki, but I can't remember um, who it is. Well, that's just great. Oh, here we go. Kennedy Lasota, harnessing your gifts and Reiki, October 27th, and that will be with Heather. So make sure you all join us for that because that will be really great. So thank you again, Lisa. I really appreciate it. And no, not that anybody's looking for me, but you guys know where to find me. I'm, I'm always here somewhere on Facebook. So thank you for watching. Good night. We'll see you next time.